John's, John's restarting his computer. It, uh, oh. Just to clarify, my name is Eli. I'm speaking first for Brentwood on Crow. Is everybody ready? Okay, then I will begin now. We affirm contention one is climate change. Without outside the action, the region isn't prioritizing a response. As Aladdin 22 explains, West Asian governments must recalibrate how they make decisions about climate related threats. Climate change will struggle to find a way to be top of national agendas, could seem just yet another problem. This has sacrificed adaptation. As Dunewall 22 laments, without adaptation, climate change is inflicting losses in West Asia, with conflict-affected countries suffering the most. Adaptation policies become a pressing priority with need for international support to finance adaptation. Luckily, U.S. diplomacy has shifted to target the threat. As USDS 22 confirms, the U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote peace will resolve a pursue a new approach to resolve ongoing violent conflicts and emphasizing environmental sustainability to create conditions for long-term regional stability. The U.S. can help West Asia adapt to climate effects and manage resources. As USSD 22 explains, to promote climate adaptation and sustainable management of resources, the United States will engage closely with the region to adapt and build resilience to respond to climate change through technical assistance and diplomacy. For example, Paris 22 writes, the State Department is working to facilitate water management through diplomacy, investing in climate-stressed water sectors, and rehabilitating water infrastructure. Adaptation is critical for <coughs> stopping climate-driven conflicts. As PSIAT includes, climate change adaptation can act as a catalyst for peaceful conflict resolution. Strengthening a country's ability to adapt can increase resilience to better withstand social and economic pressure, avoiding the destabilization of their governing institutions. Absent U.S. action, Aladdin 22 warns, with the threat of climate-induced conflicts, climate change threatens every country in the region. More than 12 million people are losing access to water and food because of rising temperatures. Contention two is democracy. As we speak, Yaha 22 explains, in West Asia, a new authoritarian order is setting over the region. Unprecedented autocratic resurgence as the U.S. disengages and geopolitical shift. Russia and China have moved to fill the void, deeply enmeshed in the Syrian conflict. The new order is destined to produce violent and a resurgence of extremism. Handler 14 continues that Russia's support to Assad involves surveillance and cyber defense. Chinese AI and drones have significant conflicts with Houthis. Friction pushes regional states to further advance cooperation with the U.S. Thus, Feinstein 22 precautions that as Beijing's willingness to sell military tech threatens security, GCC partners have been explicitly reiterating their preference for maintaining close ties to the United States. Diplomacy brings democracy promotion along with it. As Carruthers 06 finds, we see greatly increased activity in the diplomatic realm. Foreign ministries add offices of democracy and put forward strategies supporting election, elections, pushing for political openness, and support democratic reconstruction, resulting in substantial pro-democratic engagement by the U.S. to a point that every sector and countries that were touched by assistance improve their democracy. It's working now. As Ryan 22 finds, Biden is pressing Tunisia's leader to reverse weakening democracy. U.S. moves include State Department's top officials to West Asia in diplomatic discussion to force Lenage Tunisia while avoiding a total rupture. The series of U.S. visits have been effective in heading off problematic crackdown. An inclusive and transparent foreign process is going forward now. Ultimately, Castro 17 finds West Asian extremist parties threaten the free world. Democracy is the only proven remedy for every crisis. War, famine, poverty, and terrorism are generated and exacerbated by authoritarian regimes. 
Contention through is aid. The change of diplomacy is changing to include new tools, namely aid. As Book 21 explains, America is opening a new era of relentless diplomacy as using the power of our development aid to invest in new ways of lifting people up around the world. Specifically, foreign aid is used to stabilize countries to prevent conflict from forming. As O'Hare something confirms, foreign aid stabilizes countries devastated by conflict and poverty, alleviating the conditions that led to the U.S. wars that led to wars before they started. BP21 quantifies for every $1 increase received from foreign countries for every 1,000 people, the chance of the war decreased by 5%. Food assistance is central to this approach. As U.S. aid writes, U.S. aid is the largest single donor of food assistance, saving lives and reducing hunger. hunger. Crucially, Senate 22 includes that over 141 million people in Arab countries are at risk of food security. Thus, Brownwood is so proud to refer. Can you turn on the side? Okay. Everyone else got it? Okay. We negate. Contention one is diplomatic capital. Asian alliances are balanced but brittle. Long 23 writes diplomacy with South Korea and Japan appears to be driving home regional alliances. The credibility issue stems from the Pentagon strategy, which seeks to win one war when returning to another region. Biden's insurance to the late Lao is concerned to an extent. However, affirming SAP's diplomatic capital, Cook 10 explains given finite resources, US must make choice on how much dip cap to invest. It can invest equally in every crisis. Policymakers need to consider where security interests are at stake. Empirically, Fontaine 21 finds Obama's efforts to secure Middle East peace deal shows the international issue with the least chance of resolution and decide to devote maximum resources to it. Diplomatic expenditures are better directed at Indo Pacific. Time and attention represent a precious commodity easy squatters. Asia would reel in response, water 21 reps. Tokyo would losing confidence in the US could cause allies to develop strike capabilities, possibly escalating the war. Beijing would preempt Japan, causing escalation to withdraw on the US, concluding even discussion to worsen security. To make matters worse, Solomon 21 finds Korean parties calling the US to avoid tactical nukes on the peninsula to repair perceived damage to extend deterrence. Further, if Biden opts to adjust US policy, may face requests for countervailing for performance. North Korea could respond by deploying its own nukes, increasing the risk of use. Devastatingly, Chapter 4010 concludes if Asia Pacific flashpoints based on territorial disputes and political differences can double turning nuclear. Contention 2 is Turkey. Currently, Maldives may trust Finland, Sweden, are attacked to join NATO despite friction. The Turkey's under increasing pressure to ratify their bids. However, increased diplomatic efforts poison relations. Balance 21 confirms Washington may curse in Syria. De facto allies of the U.S. commitment now exists and must be honored. Backing that faction has the potential for trouble. Desire for a homeland animates Kurds in Turkey. Specifically, Maldives 22 explains Erdogan threatened to veto Nordic nations' NATO bids, setting relations with Kurds the U.S. partner. Continued possession is key to Arctic stability. Uh, Herman 22 writes Russia is taking advantage of the retreat on ice to militarize the region, and China has shown interest in energy deposits. NATO has as much as Ukraine made allies aware. Sweden and Finland will secure the Arctic through NATO. Both bring icebreakers and effective submarines and robust Arctic strategy to contain Russia and China. Ten Tensions flare up as Ferrari and explains the Arctic's at risk of nuclear escalation. The arms race as nuclear power is modernized. That solve could further destabilize nuclear balance. We're the closest ever to doomsday. Contention 3 is regional stability. Subpoint A is the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC. As America disengages, regional cooperation is rising. Many 22 weeks explains Middle East states need to hedge against the fear that the U.S. is no longer dependable. The unprecedented Israeli summit with Iran, Egypt, and Morocco, and the UAE mark for approachment. Erdogan has embarked on his own reconciliation, containing the Saudi Arabian entente appears to be taking shape. The new Middle East might work because of a less prominent U.S. Specifically, off P20 writes, GCC states have engaged in significant cooperation to climate to combat financing of terrorists, disrupt sanctions, or disrupt transactions, shut down donations, and import sanctions. Uh, and Efforts disrupted massive fundraising themselves. Overall, Fire 21 concludes Gulf countries have put aside differences and committed to common care in the region. Re engagement reverses progress. As for 18 warrants, American predominance prevents states from balancing in the face of threats. As he wins and asks the U.S. presence, states expect to form alliances if rarely does so. U.S. involvement inhibits developing ties. Counter terror cooperation is key as Middlebury 20 finds regional cooperation can be a roadmap to counter bioterror advances, detect drastically reduce costs and time of developing weapons. Al Qaeda and ISIS have expressed interest, creating a looming threat. Fire terror is essential as Wall 21 terminalizes an engineered pathogen with spread and kill quicker of eight countermeasures that would be reintroduced again and again. It could wipe us off the planet. Regionalism also supports conflicts with Alaska Trading Machine Rights. Regional all organizations are 6.7 times, 6 times more likely to craft an agreement not broken for at least five years, a substantial difference in keeping peace.
Sub point B is Israel. Murdoch Benign explains U.S. security assurance is the greatest impact on Israel's capitalism and whether it should act preventively as in Iraq and as Syria against Iraq. However, peaceful diplomacy for both military actions, wrecking Israeli assurances, passing 22 further, to stop around nuclear missions, Israel pursues military actions, lack of public education, diplomacy will not stop around the only way is military power. Diplomacy also appeases adversaries, forcing Jerusalem, Pan, Dorot, and 15 further, a diplomatic engagement of Iran and Assad with a simple plot to parents. The Israelis who long regretted Iran as an actual threat and gave policy was misguided, Israel would have no choice but strike. Al Qaeda 1129 confirms that Yahoo has to power to order an attack on Iran if U.S. can't take action, talks of plans of reformation, Israel has great capabilities for strike. In such a conflict, Avery 20 concludes Russia and China might be drawn in, nuclear weapons used intentionally or by accident, but will come a result and destroy civilization. Sub point T is Saudi Arabia. In contrast to its neighbors, increased diplomacy means decreased support for Saudi Arabia. Al Qaeda 21 finds the step of diplomacy in Yemen, by the Saudi and all American support for offensive operations. Carter 22 verse, this would stop support for Saudi intelligence sharing and sharing efforts to intercept Houthi attacks. This engagement will not end the war, but will damage relations. That's part of Saudi Korea. Because anti 15 writes, the perception of the U.S. as an unreliable ally may give the Saudi to its own deterrence through nukes. Perlick would be devastating as Edom and 11 confirmed the decision to seek nukes would increase incentives of other nations in the Middle East to pursue weapons of their own. Given close proximity, new nuclear powers might launch on a warning or use forces preemptively. Low level commanders hide in this count without sophisticated systems and attack might be in attributed incorrectly or non state actors could gain access to arsenals. Moreover, Goldenberg 17 finds lack of trust in the U.S. led the Saudis to act aggressively out of insecurity, arming Syria, Bahrain, and most notably Yemen. Thus, we negate. On your Turkey contention, uh, your Galen Evans finds that like in 2020, like in 2021, the United States already recognized the Kurds. So if that's true, then why does like more diplomacy means their Turkey is more likely to veto these NATO members when like they're already vetoing right now? Sure. So our uniqueness on the argument that says despite our past recognition of the Kurds, uh, NATO is still going to admit Finland and Turkey will still accept their bids. However, the argument is increased diplomacy with the Kurds would turn Erdogan even more against U.S. and harm relations to a low point where they won't accept the bids. Okay, you got a question. So, how does climate diplomacy mitigate ongoing conflicts? Yeah, so, because ongoing conflicts are actually, actually right, Evans, in the case, that ongoing conflicts are caused by climate change, caused by water shortages, all these things. So, with climate diplomacy, not only do we promote resilience and all these things, but take proactive action to solve internal ongoing conflicts in the future and right now. Can I ask a follow up? Yeah. Which specific conflicts does climate diplomacy mitigate? Yeah, so, for example, our Paris Evans finds, like, through water management, we can help conflicts in, like, Syria, stuff like that. Uh, but let's go back to your case on Saudi Arabia. So your evidence finds that Biden ended like like military support for Saudi Arabia in 2021. Are they proliferating right now? Uh, so it says that Biden didn't end support. It said Biden is planning to end support. And that's what we do if we increase diplomacy on the situation in Yemen. Okay. Uh, so on Syria, as your example, was the conflict in Syria caused by climate change? We say, like, like, even though there's other factors involved, climate change made the conflict, one, much worse, but also it made the humanitarian situation so, so much worse because they're on basic access to food, to water, all these things. The United States diplomacy could specifically help. But yeah, so yeah, that's why. But going back to your case. So on your first argument about diplomatic capital, so does you know, the United States right now do diplomacy in a lot of like regions around the world? Sure. Just do diplomacy in only Asia. Uh, we do diplomacy all around the world. The argument is that increasing diplomacy to the Middle East will require a trade off with our diplomacy elsewhere in the world. Okay, can I just quick follow up yep. to that? So, if West Asia, I'm sorry, East Asia is so important to the United States, like so many allies like Japan and South Korea, why would we trade off? I know you, like your Evan says, like, oh, we have to, but why would we do such a massive trade off? Can we take that from other places? Sure. So our Cook 10 card says that it must make like a ch we must have a choice. But specifically, uh, I think it's the Wadworth card says that the most like or the Fontaine card. Sorry, says the most likely place it would come from would be the Indo-Pacific because that's where we kind of are devoting the majority of the resources from. So the majority would come from there. Okay. You know. Uh, let's talk about aid. What ongoing conflicts would foreign aid resolve? Yeah. So the idea is that foreign aid. <coughs> One, all the humanitarian issues, all the food, all the water that these people need, the aid provides for people who are at risk of conflict or conflicts that are already occurring. But also, in these same examples, all these conflicts we'd say with Israel and Palestine, with Syria, with like Iran, stuff like that, that's where the aid would solve, that's what gives all these issues. So, it's completely can I have a follow up? Yeah, sure. Which, like historically, how has foreign aid mitigated conflicts? Like, which conflict? Yeah, so in the past, foreign aid has been crucial for economic development, all these things to mitigate conflict. I can give you other examples, I think all these really cool.
down their case, yeah, starting with their argument on diplomatic capitalism. You're reading that uh, a few places, some of it in this analytics. I can just send it to you if you want afterwards, if that's okay. All right. If everyone's good, we'll start by, oh, sorry, yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Start by now. On their argument about diplomatic capital, a few problems. First, they say our alliances are just brittle, but it's not just that. In fact, our clear evidence buys for Indo-Pacific states picking sides with risk jeopardizing regional stability. Most Pacific states want to continue to enjoy trade with China, and wisened by the Trump years, many Asian leaders are observing with skepticism Biden's attempts to undo diplomatic efforts. That means that regional states in Asia already don't trust the United States. If their impacts were true and they were going to get these nuclear first strike capabilities, it should have already happened. And so far as it hasn't, their arguments are historically disproven. Second, their thing about finite diplomatic resources makes no sense. In fact, our Stevenson evidence finds Congress vetoed overwhelmingly to restore, or Congress rather, voted overwhelmingly to restore funding for DIPCAP to resume hiring and restore staffing. We must upgrade our diplomatic capability to compete in the current environment. We need to restore funding managers smartly to force relationships responding to crises and encouraging others to share the burden. That means we just increase more diplomats, increase our funding, and then just do diplomacy in Asia and the Middle East. There's no reason why we can't do both. Finally, if anything, U.S. does diplomacy in West Asia and other regions to the same capacity to appear reliable. To our, all our Morgan evidence by security architecture in West Asia is founded on reassurance to partners in other regions. That means it's all spread out. Next, move on to Turkey. One, the United States has been backing the Kurds for years, but has been involved with like the PKK since 2016, giving them arms to fight terror, and NATO still has gotten stuff passed and through in the last five years. Obviously, that has this hasn't imposed like impeded like NATO's policies in the past. Turkey hasn't vetoed everything for like the last five years, so obviously their arguments are again historically disproven. But two, the United States also has access to the Arctic through like Alaska. NATO allies like Canada also have access to the Arctic. They can just militarize there. There's absolutely no reason why Finland is like the key player. And three, there's no reason why these countries would go to war over like the Arctic. They never contextualize their scenario enough. There's absolutely nowhere to vote on their arguments. Now, move on to regionalism. A few problems. At the top, their argument that the region is thriving now could not be further from the truth. As authors Thane, Vinality, and Tahan explain, Syria has seen feverish jockeying. Lebanon is facing massive challenges and political pressure, and an Israeli-Palestinian conflict seems inevitable with hundreds of Palestinians killed. Thus, U.S. diplomacy is key, as Stein and Vinality conclude, Washington is needed in the region. It's clear that regional cooperation is not solving the conflicts now. If anything, in the last months, things have been, got, things have been getting much worse. Their arguments are historically disproven. But two, US, US, the United States is needed for a few reasons. One, regional ties. Wolfert 13 explains that the U.S. security ties foster political communication that binds states together to great cooperation, and Brands concludes that retrenching will make the U.S. lose all of its restraining leverage it has on its allies, thus leaving behind a more chaotic environment, forcing countries to fend for themselves. Refer this analysis, France continues, the Arab states have always viewed it bitterly due to their divides, but the U.S. is the only actor that can drive peace in the region. The root cause of the conflicts is ethno-sectarian tensions. They're not just going to solve those magically on their own. That's why there's so much conflict right now. They get no solvency. Then go to Israel. One, the United States has engaged with Iran in the past diplomatically, for example, the nuclear deals. Nothing happened, historically untrue. Two, their evidence says that Israel is already acting, so their impact should, should have already happened. And three, their evidence says military powers, not diplomacy, and the US definitely won't go in militarily and risk the conflict. Now go to Saudi Arabia. One, on their Saudi proliferation impact, their link disproves the impact. If Saudi Arabia proliferates and directly goes against US orders and interests, that would destroy their alliance with the United States, which their own argument says the Saudis want to avoid. Second, their al-Dasari evidence is very bad. It says that stepped up the tax temp we stepped up the tax temporarily because, or Yemen did, because the Houthis did, because they wanted more leverage in diplomacy. So if Biden actually followed through, it would have worked. If not retaliation, they just wanted more skin in the game, and the evidence said Biden wanted to, but didn't follow through, the affirmative solves. Finally, their link that Congress will pass legislation makes no sense. There's not enough contextualization. There's no reason why affirming means it's actually passed. None of their evidence that as it happens because of diplomacy, none of it works, none of it makes sense. It's historically disproven, affirmed. Uh, Oh, yeah. Give me a second to get it together. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to turn it to the TV. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think it's just a matter of time. Go on to the next one. Yeah, I'd have to 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
having our, they didn't say what evidence already says that, but we haven't. They said the uh, U.S. wouldn't go in militarily. That's precisely the point. We would go in diplomatically, which is a concession to Iran per our link evidence, and that would force Israel to strike on Saudi Arabia. They say it would destroy a relationship with the U.S. Our evidence says that they were willing to do so if they believe that the U.S. is no longer credible, which diplomacy would do. They say oh, something about the Houthis arguing, something about the Houthis, but about Prolif. They say that our evidence um, does not have, we don't have a reason why they would cut off support. Parsi 22 finds the war in Yemen is one of the few things Republicans and Democrats can agree on. Also, they haven't read why we wouldn't do it. Our evidence says that the only proposal is to decrease arms sales. Let's go to their case. On climate change, one, climate diplomacy is non-topical. Resolve is defined by Congress as a solver and a problem. Climate diplomacy does not, neither given a lack of resource conflicts in the present. Resolve is not synonymous with prevent. Prevention doesn't require a problem, but a potential one. Even if topical, the app advocacy is at the very least unlikely. Politicians adhere to near-term election cycles, seek immediate results, and prioritize domestic action, especially given a lack of precedent abroad. Two, climate change doesn't cause conflicts. Refer consensus. Meyer 18. After undertaking a large-scale analysis of more than 100 papers published on the topic connected to the climate change and war, overstate the link. Lit says that climate change causes conflicts is based on sampling errors. Three, Biden's all talk. He's still oil thirsty. Strong heart 22. Last year, Biden said high energy prices only reinforce the need to double down on clean energy. Analysts expect oil production will be a top already when uh, it meets with uh, officials from Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, Iraq, and Jordan. On their second contention, one, there are all causes for autocracy, a mod, a non-22. Authoritarian persistence in West Asia results of religious ex exceptionalism, inhospitality toward democratization, lack, lack of taxation, the presence of heavy security apparatus, and lack of any credible political opposition. Two, U.S. bends the need to authoritarianism via diplomacy. Dorothy 21, U.S. Middle East policies likely to maintain long-standing support for autocratic rule and the belief that it will ensure stability. U.S. policy and practice is not different from Chinese backing continuous baby steps, do not fundamentally alter things. Indeed, Hashimi 12, de 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 democratic forces refuse to place more rule in Western interests. It's much simpler to manipulate a few ruling families, cut the card there. Um, lastly, reject their impact. It's a laundry list of unwarranted, like, analytics as to why um, like it would cause uh, like ma massive conflicts. They could just sandbag them and then go for the warrant that's dropped, which kills engagement. And Kasparov plays chess. He doesn't write about foreign policy. The evidence should be rejected on credibility alone. On aid, one aid is not topical. Resolve is by Congress as to solve our end problem. That's the definition above. The goal of aid is not to resolve, but to help conditions on the ground. The 5% statistic does not apply because A, it's about prevention, and B says merely it's a downstream effect, not a goal. Two, aid is not effective in West Asia. Their evidence is not specific. Zouder, 19. Foreign aid has large unintended consequences, leading to very high levels of corruption, inequality, and tensions. Foremost among victims of the Middle East and region that have foreign aid has been persistent. And lastly, their um, internal link evidence is from USAID rejected. Cyber 21. Only a small percent of USAID evaluations regularly estimate the degree to which intervention improves outcomes. Fewer than 5% are methodologically credible. Um, their 140 million is just that the amount that's Food insecure in West Asia, not the amount that the app would help. I have more time, so I'll go back up to um, autocracy. Uh, turn the argument greater engagement in Bolton's autocrats. Hoffman 22. Cementing Washington's commitment to the Middle East would only sort of formalize U.S. commitment to the actors that would create widespread unrest. The move would embolden autocrats, demonstrating that bad behavior is rewarded. You said all the rhetoric on, I guess, wait, did you send rhetoric for our kicks as well? I just, I just read off the card. Okay, that's fine. I'll send a Mark version. You had everything that that I just said. Okay, yes. yeah. yeah. First question since we spoke first? Yeah. Awesome. Start time down. All right, so let's go to your argument on Saudi Arabia, right? Okay. So, what exactly is their incentive to proliferate if it risks all these conflicts and wars? Because they fear for their national security. The evidence, the Gazatsky evidence, which is dropped, says that if the Saudi Arabia perceives the US to be an unreliable ally, 
they will not hesitate to take action like with their own hands. It's not like we've always been reliable to Saudi Arabia. I mean, like over the years, the U.S. advanced on like weapon sales with different presidential transitions. We've been okay, so wait, wait, past, so wait, what, 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 what have we done to undermine the relationship? Yeah, like I said, in the past, we've banned some weapon sales. Some like, weapon sales. Our support. Okay, we've shifted from the region. So like, why hasn't that? Triggered some weapon sales is different from ending all arms sales, which is what we say would happen. So like, we still have support for the region. This also was a response you could have made in rebuttal, but chose well, not to. It's still important to talk about, but okay, yeah, and again. Uh, ending our, all arms sales is fundamentally different. Super okay, tough. can you name a successful U.S. Democratic promotion effort in West Asia? Uh, in West Asia, not specifically because we haven't engaged with the region that happened through the affirmative, but the riot evidence that you haven't responded to says that in Tunisia right now, Biden is working and has been successful in implementing successful democratic Why is reform. Tunisia applicable? Like, Tunisia is not in West Asia. Because it's what Biden's doing right now through democratic in, position. But, like, in Tunisia, right? Yeah, like, why so, does that yeah, apply? Yeah, like to? I said, we haven't engaged diplomatically and demo democratically with so, West Asia. We'll do that through the affirmative, but if we look at what is, Biden's is doing it, right is now, it your claim, in Tunisia, it's working. Is it your claim that the U.S. has never diplomatically engaged with West Asia? I mean, that's like diplomatically, how we just say we have it, like, like the Biden administration. Why does diplomacy not, mean? Why does diplomacy mean promoting democracy? Yeah, because like we need incentives. If I like, well, what, evidence, what evidence, evidence did you read? This is that Biden wants to promote democracy via diplomacy. Uh, it's the corrupt administration. Okay, what does it say? It just says like Biden is like there's incentives. He like, has an interest in promoting democracy, not democracy through diplomacy. Like yeah, if that, Biden how, is engaging with the region before and hasn't promoted diplomacy through democracy or well, other way that, around. Yeah, but so it sounds really confusing, but at its core, it's really simple. We're just simply not engaging with West Asia right now. In order to engage, obviously Biden wants the region to be stable. Otherwise, it can be like unstable regimes that cause his engagement to fail. Also, if his diplomacy is what's found reliable authoritarian regimes, it's not going to work as well. That's why he has an incentive to promote democracy. The only reason <coughs> is because there hasn't been an affirmative ballot. Can I take the question? Yeah. Awesome. Let's go to your response to this on climate change, right? Yeah. So why exactly does climate change like not matter? I mean, I didn't say it doesn't matter. I'm like, I believe climate change is real and is a present threat. I just don't think it causes resource conflicts. Why not? Because we have a peer review of over 100 articles, I, academic articles, that I says that why. it's not a significant driver. Like, just because you lack resources isn't a big enough incentive to go to war. Most well, instances, okay, most instances of resource conflicts enable cooperation and have other factors. Like, you can't end a conflict by getting right. rid of climate change. So, like, there are still other things that promote the conflict. So, re if resolve means to end a problem, that means taking out the root of it, yeah. and the root of it is not climate so change by any means. One, there's unprecedented water shortage in the region, and you've conceded conflicts in Lebanon, Syria, all over the region are at all time. They're, like, maybe two, contributed to yeah. it by climate change. Two, but like, my people are starving, I'm definitely not going to just let that happen. Is there a minute? Yeah, a minute three, and 3.81 three seconds. One second. Okay. The last... Uh, uh, started from the last two, or sorry, 157 or 56, starting now. Bro, if I pause crap really quick, my computer's not connected. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, uh, should be good. Okay, so we've been with the main thing. Okay, we'll stop at a minute, minute 50 U, so we have like seven seconds.
and it's just gonna be our case, the comparative between the two arguments, like the two sides, and then their case. Is everybody ready? Okay, then I will begin now. On climate aid, we'll concede that it's not topical, so all this stuff doesn't matter. Look to authoritarianism as the most important argument in the round. With Russia and China pulling the power back and left bounded by the US, y'all have fine with authoritarianism is taking over West Asia. Autocrats are aided by dangerous Chinese AI and drones, but countries in the region prefer the United States because of these risks. Thus, the policy brings democracy, solving these issues through forward strategies. As Kasparov concludes, extremist parties threaten the world, democracy solves problems like war, famine, and poverty. They give a lot of responses, but they all fundamentally miss the mark. First, they talk about all this stuff about how like a lot of stuff like actually doesn't help like U.S. aid doesn't help and causes more authoritarianism. A few issues here. First of all, but our link evidence lines from others that we support elections, all these things. That's why we're every place not, like, where United States goes, we prove democracy in every single facet. But then yeah, not every single facet. But then they talk about how like uh, it angers autocracies and causes all these things. One, if it angers autocracies like Saudi Arabia, then it's clearly not the, the, the argument that it's, like Saudi Arabia is like angered by diplomacy. It's clearly not true because we're helping Saudi Arabia. That's like autocracy. But second of all, they have no warrant for this evidence. But second of all, they, their own evidence says that autocracies breed an instability, so even just our impact evidence, their own evidence finds that autocrats breed instability. Then, uh, they, the, uh, yeah, then, then they talk about like how like, it doesn't actually solve all these issues. One, our, our Tunisia uh, empiric goes conceded that what our find find that right now in the 2022, which postdates all of their evidence, and their evidence from 2012, which finds that right now we're helping democracy promotion in Tunisia, which is very key, because when we're helping democracy over in Tunisia, which is by and from shift our approach to help democracy across the world. Then they say like, that we're just giving it, it's easy to give the ruling families one, then that's again disproves Saudi. But also they just give like no warrant for why we do this. They say like it's easier. Even just because it's easier doesn't mean we'll do it. And our evidence is like ten years later. Then they say our thing is unwarranted. First of all, Gary Kasparov like pretty smart. Like I don't know what they're talking about. But second of all, their own evidence finds that it breeds instability. Just logically, authoritarianism breeds instability. They're not worried about the people. Yeah. Oh, go to their case. Oh, sorry, go to the comparative. On our case, our case of fundamental prayer is that they have conceded the warrants of our evidence that extremist parties cause instability and threaten the world. They say we don't get warrants. Yes, we do. They've also conceded that historically the only solvency for the problems identified in their case, war part of democracy, is democracy. Also, if Saudi Arabia and Turkey weren't authoritarian, their arguments wouldn't be problems in the first place. Their arguments disprove that authoritarianism like, isn't bad. Go to their case. First of all, on diplomatic capital, just because like it's easier just like, to shift the diplomacy doesn't mean that we will. Our evidence finds that we're funny right now. It's not just Congress rhetoric, but also uh, Congress rhetoric. But also, our evidence finds that like like why we shift away from West Asia. Also, on this thing about dates, like we should reject their evidence. First of all, we have dates in case. But second of all, we send all their evidence so they can see the dates. On Turkey, they can see that Canada also solves the Arctic, which means that we don't need Finland and Finland and stuff. And also, it's just like Turkey rhetoric; they're going to reject it. Uh, on, the, on the region as a whole, they say like, it's about terror, not conflict, but also if all these conflicts are happening right now, which they have conceded in Syria, in Lebanon, in Israel, it shows that they can't solve any of the conflicts, but also if there's destabilization right now, which they can't solve all the conflicts, but also they can see the brand evidence that Arab states have always feared, which disproves all of their other links, because insofar as they've always feared, it shows that Israel and Saudi will always proliferate, always have this incentive. On Israel, they can see that during the Biden, like, during the Obama administration, they had the Iran, Iran nuclear deal, which they agreed, so they, uh, Israel should have gotten mad on Saudi, uh, yeah, and, and on side, like, they're doing the policy right now.
case starting on GCC. Is everyone good? Yes, John. First on GCC, they say this conflicts now, where it doesn't matter if these conflicts stay limited. Second, we are the arguments out here are not about conflicts, so it doesn't matter if there's conflicts going on. Third, cooperation, if they're cooperating on, on stopping terrorism and other things like that, they have no incentive to go to war because they want to continue the cooperation going on. From there, extend the rest of the link. Cooperation is high among West Asian states. America's perceived withdrawal as four states swore together, knowing Uncle Sam is no longer there to hold their hands. With increased cooperation in their country their efforts and shutting down illicit financing, only regional cooperation will succeed as their proximity provides valuable insight and enables rapid response to the sevenfold increase in FC per Velasco. Such cooperation is key to prevent bioterrorist interest rates and tech advantage. If released, biopathogens would be engineered, spread uncontrollably, culminate in extinction. They don't respond to the terrorism impact at all. We outweigh for a few reasons. First, on probability, these terrorists want to cause harm. However, there's no incentive for authoritarian regimes to just go to war. They don't want to like destroy their own nations and kill their own people. Second, we outweigh on time frame. We say that as soon as you affirm, you lead to this counter-terror operation stopping and you lead to this prolif. We say they can do it now. The only thing that's holding them back is GCC counter-terror operations. Third, we outweigh because we're giving you a specific scenario on how terrorists will get their weapons. We say they can do it and we're giving you a clear impact. Their impact is just generically democracy, instability. You don't really know what it is. You should prefer us on specificity. Then on Saudi Arabia, they say we're doing diplomacy. However, we're not ending arms deals now. If you increase diplomacy, you would end arms deals with Saudi Arabia. From there, extend the argument. While America and Saudi Arabia have been staunch allies for years, Biden's new policy has been affirming would end military support to the Saudis for, to end the war in Yemen. Unfortunately, this democratic push would be meaningless in ending the war in Yemen, something the monarchy views as protecting their regime. Rather, it would force Saudi Arabia to, pr to pursue independent deterrence through a nuclear weapons program, cascading throughout West Asia as allies of rivals like race into nuclear age. A host of new uh, and new nuclear states would make miscalculation inevitable, which spirals into a conflict extinction from a nuclear winter induced famine. This links into their authoritarianism argument because it's the bad conditions on the ground that lead to authoritarian regimes becoming in a place. It also waste because when these countries get nukes, that leads to a nuclear war. However, these countries, authoritarian regimes in the Middle East don't have nukes, but if you lead to prolif throughout the Middle East, they gain nuclear weapons, which escalates the conflict and outweighs because nuclear war is the biggest impact. Then on their case. So first on democracy, they've dropped that there's all causes to democracy, specifically our nonpartisan uh, religious exceptionalism, inhospitality towards democratization, lacks of taxation, the presence of heavy security apparatus, and the lack of any credible political opposition means that there's all causes of authoritarianism democracy that uh, increased diplomacy can't solve. They've also dropped that US diplomacy bends the knee to authoritarian regimes because that's a simply easier thing to do. Their corruptive evidence is from 2016 and not about the current, uh, like, not about Biden, then they, the U.S. does what's in its best interest. So just because in Tunisia we're promoting democracy, that's because that's what the U.S. sees in its best interest. However, in the Middle East, we see it's in our best interest to just manipulate the, the elites because it's the easiest thing to do. So therefore, in the Middle East, if you pursue diplomacy, you would be pursuing, uh, like, bending the knee to authoritarian regimes and increasing authoritarianism. Even if you grant them their impact, their impact is just instability. They're not making the entire world democratic. It's just a really vague impact. They say that Kasparov is a good source. However, Kasparov is just a guy that played chess. He doesn't know what he's talking about on this impact of democracy. Even if you grant them... Uh, actually, yeah. Then lastly, they've also dropped that the goal of U.S. getting involved um, like in the Middle East, when we do greater engagement, we embolden autocrats. They say that they won't get angry, however, that's not the argument. The argument is that we embolden them because they see that they have U.S. support, and then therefore we, they'll be more likely to pursue their policy and expand authoritarianism. Thus, you should negate. Okay. Are you ready for a grant? Crossfire? Yeah. I had an open crossfire. Can we first question? Yes. Okay. So I guess let's talk about this whole like authoritarianism thing with like best interest. Mm -hmm. So is it in Biden's best interest to like fund authoritarian states? Is that yeah. what you're saying? So yeah. if that's true, then why don't they like help we why do. wouldn't they help Saudi Arabia with these like we do. States? So like why wouldn't we increase that under diplomacy? Because we would have to do. I mean if you want to concede that we would support Saudi Arabia, sure, we'll take Saudi Arabia and you don't have a case. That's fine. Okay. So you I, yeah, I see. I, either one of two things is true. You don't have a case or we have Saudi Arabia. Okay. Um, very much have yeah, okay. Um, okay, so in your lab, in your summary speech, I think you said uh, like something along the lines of every time the U.S. has gotten involved, it has promoted democracy and done good. Like, do you, do you actually believe that? Like, like what, what about like in Latin America? What about like all the like, sure, like, you Iraq? Can, you can make one, like a few examples, but what I, I think what I was meant to say with the Carruthers evidence is that when the United States goes in the region and promotes demo dep uh, democracy, specifically right now in the recent times, it goes through in every single sector of development, which means so what, what is Carruthers from? What? It's from 2006, right? So why does that apply yeah, so like to the recent evidence is that like, evidence about Tunisia has been rocked. Well, Tunisia is not in West Asia. Tunisia might be in the best interest of the well, U.S. Yeah, but what the U.S. is doing right now, so it's like the most recent, most relevant example. Well, I understand that they're doing that in Tunisia, but like we have evidence about the Middle yeah. East. So like, why can't we apply what we're doing to Tunisia? Because to Tunisia has, okay, like, there's a different security apparatus in Tunisia versus like a raging nucleus of I mean, hotspots in the Middle yeah. East. So excuse me, one, like North Africa and the Middle East have a lot of the same like sectarian divide. Like it's still like, like fundamentally similar, but two, if the Biden approaches like like two foreign policy has been something in one place, there's no reason it would be any okay. different in another place and so forth, especially since you've conceded the incentives that we want the region to be stable, to engage with it diplomatically. I guess you have a question? Yeah, go for it. All right. 
Yeah, so I guess let's go to the, like, your argument with the GCC. Yeah. Or whatever it is. So, in, so like, your argument is that they solve terror, but if the region as a whole is destabilizing, how are they able to solve terror and how are they able to sustain yeah, it? Yeah, like the Middle East has been destabilized, right? Like, it doesn't matter if it's destabilized unless you read evidence saying that destabilization prevents them from cooperating on terror. They can still fund counter terror operations because they can all agree that terrorism is bad and do that simultaneously. Like, maybe they aren't solving conflicts. Like, we agree. We just say that solving conflicts is a bad thing because we can't solve them. If the U.S. attempts to resolve internal armed conflicts, it just creates further divisions within the GCC. Um, that's not where their goals or ideolo ideologies align, which splits the alliance. Okay, you can answer. Outside of Tunisia, where is the U.S. growing democracy? I mean, the U.S. like Tunisia is most like at any any example outside of Tunisia. So I think uh, Evans we did not read said like after World War II from a like democracy development in like Europe as a whole. Europe as yeah, a whole. Yeah, I think that's so. a really good example because Western Europe was just as unstable, it was like pretty much like parallel to what the Middle East is today. Who was the president back then? I don't know, he's probably dead, I don't know, but like, yeah, that's like I don't know, like, it's a really suspect. Yeah, okay. Alright, y'all want a question? Uh, we have like 10 seconds. John, how's your day been? <coughs> Boy, bueno. Ooh, okay. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. knock. Ooh. Interrupting timer. Interrupting timer. Uh -huh. There you go. Awesome. Okay. Case, the app case, and compare it between our arguments and their case, the next case. If everyone's good, let's start time now. The easiest place to vote is our argument on democracy. With Russia and China filling the power vacuum left behind the US, Yahya finds authoritarianism is taking over West Asia. Autocrats are aided by dangerous Chinese AI and drones, but countries in the region prefer the US because of these risks. Thus, diplomacy brings democracy, solving these issues through forward strategies. Kasparov concludes extremist parties threaten the world. Democracy solve problems like war, famine, and poverty. They give a lot of responses, but they all miss the mark. They say there's alternative causes. It doesn't matter because we, like no matter what the cause is, US, US democracy solves it. They say the US bands together and our corrupt resentments from 2016, we bend the knee to the elite. But what John Summary has fundamentally mishandled is the Ryan evidence that says in Tunisia, Biden's administration, which they've conceded is the most recent example of democracy promotion, is working in Tunisia. There's no reason why it wouldn't work in the Middle East. We want to approach the same way because they've also conceded that we have the incentive to work with the region when it's more stable. We don't want we don't want, we don't want to do diplomacy with autocrats. We want to do diplomacy with democracies, which is why we'll do democracy promotion in the Middle East. People, autocrats won't be emboldened because they concede we're just supporting elections. We're not actually supporting them. At that point, draw the line. They fully conceded the Tunisia, like fundamentally conceded the Tunisia empiric that postdates all of their evidence. That means the U.S. does democracy promotion. At that point, go to the comparative. Firstly, they say terrorists want to do harms, but so do revisionist states that are like autocratic. They say there's time frame because their argument's happening immediately, but they've conceded that the region is unstable, GCC isn't working, and then they say they have a specific scenario. But again, we also give you a specific scenario where it worked in Tunisia. At that point, they have fundamentally conceded our prerequisite that because democracy solves for problems like war, famine, and instability, it is the root cause, or like it solves for all the root causes of their conflicts. That means our case is a prior question to their case, and at the point where we're winning democracy, we win the round. But even if you want to go to their case, they have conceded the analysis throughout the round. As for our evidence that says that GC, like Arab states have underlying cultural differences, that means they're always feuding. That means Saudi Arabia will never work together. The GCC will never work together. That's just been conceded in every speech of the round. Draw the line. Don't let Isan wiggle out of it with a new response and final focus. The round is over. Also, the region is very unstable, so it's clearly not working. Vote next. Saudi Arabia is conceded. While America and Saudi Arabia have been staunch allies for U.S. Biden's new policies, mean affirming would end military support to the Saudis to end the war in Yemen. Unfortunately, this diplomatic push would mean meaningless to end, to end the war in Yemen, something the monarchy views as protecting the regime. Rather, it would force Saudi Arabia to pursue independent nuclear deterrence through a nuclear weapons program, cascading throughout West Asia as allies and rivals alike race into a nuclear age. A host of fearful new moves of states will make this calculation now, which rivals in a conflict and distinction from nuclear induced winner. All of their weighing was against GCC, not the Saudi Arabia argument. They have dropped that specificity comes first. Like, literally, what is their impact? It's quote unquote instability and driving conflicts, which they have absolutely no warrant for, saying that autocrats just want to go to war. They fundamentally 
fundamentally cannot cause extinction if they don't have nuclear weapons, which is the only scenario for extinction, red. And they've dropped that if Saudi Arabia lashes out because they have nuclear weapons, the entire Middle East has nuclear weapons, which dramatically increases the likelihood of that. Plus, their time frame is incredibly unclear. When do they solve democracy throughout the entire world? And like West Asia becomes like full of roses. That never happens. However, we give you a specific scenario on Saudi Arabia proliferating, which is far more probable, and it's also conceded. So if you're looking at the defense page, we're definitely winning there. Let's go to their case on um, democracy. So first argument we'll extend is the alt causes. John extended religious exceptionalism, inhospitality, lack of taxation, and a lack of a security apparatus. They magically say the US can solve these issues? Like how? If the, the, the governments don't want democracy in West Asia, then obviously the US can't install a peaceful leader. Then they say that Tunisia proves their link to be true. They have dropped the, the way the US promotes democracy and the way the US does foreign policy is what's in its best interest. Maybe in Tunisia, democratic promotion was in their best interest, but our Dorsey evidence is just so much better on this question. It says that in the Middle East, it is far easier to manipulate ruling elites, and as a result, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't support democratic transitions, but rather bend the knee to autocrats. It, the evidence literally says if the U.S. perceives it as increasing stability because there are no new regimes and we can control them like puppet states, which means that there is no democratic promotion, and then even if there is, like their impact is incredibly suspect. Like They say instability is caused, but that's very vague, and they don't link the instability to Saudi Arabia specifically, um, because Saudi Arabia obviously hasn't gone to war yet, and the, war, uh, the world is obviously not ended. So, yeah. Good round, Good
say. Okay. Uh, congrats on getting to the Aftos here at Durham. It was a 3-0 decision for the negative from Strict Jesuit. I'll go quickly. Uh, Saudi Perlof is conceded. I think that this is probably the easiest path to offense. Uh, I think that the negative uh, wins a substantial risk there. Uh, I do not think that the affirmative is winning as large of a risk on the democracy flow. Uh, I think that the easier path here uh, to win defense probably is this like alt pauses argument. I think that that's probably just easier than this like bended knee or, or bended knee argument um, because I think that that probably takes out any prereq argument that they're trying to spin. Um, yeah. I would agree. Uh, Pearl is just a little bit. I played well. Same here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.